While South Carolina can claim many celebrated musicians throughout history, a talented singer and guitarist born in Greenville, South Carolina, is often overlooked today. Throughout his charismatic career as a bluesman, cabaret star, and folk singer, Josh White at one time rivaled contemporaries such as Harry Belafonte and Bob Dylan for worldwide popularity. His charm and musical ability took him from humble beginnings, performing his brand of Piedmont blues in the early 20th century Southeast, to acclaim in New York City clubs in the 1940s, and world over tours ushering in the folk music revival of the mid 20th century. At the start of the 20th century, Greenville, South Carolina, locally known as the Pearl of the Piedmont, was in the middle of an industrial revolution. Beginning in the 1870s, the great textile mills that grew up on the west side of the city soon became the dominant industry, eventually forming the economic basis of the entire upstate region well into the 1980s. Although the city's fortunes were improving after the social and political upheaval of the Civil War, the era of punitive and harsh racial regulation and suppression, known as the Jim Crow era, was in full swing. It was into this world that Josh White would be born. The city's social and infrastructure improvements were not equally shared by all the town residents. The trolley lines were created in 1899 and began running routes starting in 1902, but the cars were segregated along with every other aspect of town life. By 1912, segregation in the city was written into the city code in an attempt to keep the races separate in all areas of life. By 1917, there were five white motion picture theaters on Main Street, but there were only two for the African-American population, and they were located on Washington Avenue near the train depot. Interestingly, Josh White had a minor movie role in a western called The Walking Hills, which according to this April 1950 Greenville News ad, was shown at local Liberty Theater. One of the reasons the textile mills made the move from their northeastern bases of operation was a desire to relocate closer to the source material of their industry, the cotton fields of the South. This 1911 image from the suburbs of Greenville shows the hands-on nature of cotton picking as it existed at the time. African Americans had traditionally done the labor necessary to produce cotton, from planting, to picking, to moving the bales to the mills, but they were mostly prohibited from working in the mills themselves. These jobs were reserved for the indigent white population, which had been recruited from the surrounding mountain communities. Under slavery, it was illegal to teach African Americans to read and write. However, by 1899, there were several elementary schools and one high school for black children in Greenville. Josh White is said to have made it to the sixth grade at Sterling High School with a budding career in music already taking priority at a young age. Greenville's urban and rural African-American families proved to be just as proud and hardworking as any other Americans, even though they were prevented from full participation in the rewards of American life. Josh White's grandfather, Boschel Humphrey, was a servant of the Malden family of Greenville. In this turn-of-the-century photo of the houses on West Washington Street, the Sam Malden house is partially visible on the far left. Boschel Humphrey was the son of Tom Humphrey, an enslaved man born in Lawrence County. Although Boschel is first listed as a Greenville resident in the 1901 Greenville City Directory in the colored block of Calhoun Street, he had been living in town since at least 1880 when he was listed as a servant in the William Malden household. Boschel had a daughter, Daisy Elizabeth Humphrey, who would go on to marry Dennis White, a local tailor and porter, as well as an occasional minister at the Allen Temple AME Church in Greenville. It is said that Daisy, also known to the family as Lizzie, was a meticulous housekeeper and enjoyed playing the auto harp. It was to these parents Josh White was born on February 11, 1914, and was himself drawn to music, singing in church at an early age. Sadly, Josh's childhood innocence would be short-lived when in 1921 his father was involved in an altercation with a white bill collector, leading to Dennis White's violent arrest by the local police. Dennis was deemed mentally unfit, most likely due to a combination of daring to strike a white policeman in Jim Crow, South Carolina, 
as well as being epileptic, and placed in the custody of the state asylum in Columbia, South Carolina. Dennis would eventually die while incarcerated, apparently of pulmonary tuberculosis, in 1930. Without a father and a family in need of income, Josh, at just eight years old, convinced his mother to allow him to work as a lead boy to a host of regional blind blues minstrels. While Josh was paired with these bluesmen, beginning with neighbor Blind Man Arnold, and later musicians such as Blind Joe Taggart and Blind Lemon Jefferson, they would busk and perform around the Southeast and Midwest. While Josh said these men could treat him cruelly, he used the opportunity as a traveling showman to learn his musical craft and hone his skills as an entertainer. Most likely, Josh and these bluesmen would travel by way of railroad, considering that the Southern as well as P&N rail lines ran through Greenville in support of the textile industry, and had the benefit of connecting traveling musicians to many towns and small cities where they could perform. Josh would go on to learn guitar well enough to spend time in recording studios in Chicago, accompanying blind Joe Taggart and even making a few recordings of his own while still in his mid-teens. Eventually, Josh decided to travel back to Greenville to see his mother and return to life as a teenager in his hometown. During this time, and resting from a football injury, the opportunity to restart his career as a solo artist knocked when a record label representative came to Greenville to offer Josh a recording contract in New York City. One of the first songs he recorded at this time was a boastful reference to his roots called The Greenville Chic, heard here. My name, folks, I'm trying to introduce myself to you. The green old kid is my name, trying to introduce myself to you. Says I'm all hot and bothered, but I don't know what to do. Says the kid not so hot and the green old kid not so cold. Greenville kid is not so hot, Lord, the kid is not so cold. He's cause a many cause to worry about him deep down in their soul. While in New York, Josh's fame grew, not only from his recordings, but also his many performances at the infamous Cafe Society in Greenwich Village, which featured integrated blues, jazz, and folk acts. Also during this time, in 1940, with the help of famed folk archivist Alan Lomax, Josh performed for President Franklin D. Roosevelt and First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt for events commemorating the 75th anniversary of the 13th Amendment, as well as an inaugural ball. In 1945, he was the first African American to perform a nationwide tour and was an unofficial advisor to the First Lady on racial issues. Unfortunately, Josh's associations with the Cafe Society would overshadow his relationship with the President and First Lady. In 1950, he was blacklisted for the perceived communist leanings of the Cafe Society's owners, patrons, and performers. Josh volunteered to explain himself to the House Un-American Activities Committee in September of that year in an attempt to assert his patriotism. Though Josh had only ever written protest songs in support of racial and economic equality, the damage was done to his career when the press painted Josh as betraying his progressive friends to the Red Scare. While his popularity due to political fallout waned stateside, Josh was able to carry on his musical career abroad and toured extensively in Europe as one of the most prominent black folk singers. Sadly, Josh would never again achieve the same level of acclaim in the U.S. and would pass away during open heart surgery in a Long Island hospital in September 1969. His gift of blues and folk music remains a major influence on musicians and music fans around the world, with Greenville, South Carolina memorializing a hometown music legend with an official Josh White monument 
to be dedicated in 2021. It was down by old Joe's bar on a corner of the square. They were serving drinks as usual, and the usual crowd was there. On my left stood Big Joe McKennedy, and his eyes were bloodshot red, and he turned his face to the people. These were the very words he said. I was down to St. James Infirmary. I saw my baby there. She was stretched out on a long white table. So sweet, cool, and so fair. Let her go, let her go, God bless her. Wherever she may be. She may search this whole wide world over, never find a sweeter man as me. When I die, please bury me in my high top Stetson hat. Put a twenty dollar gold piece on my watch chain. The gang all know I die standing pat. Let her go, let her go, God bless her. Wherever she may be, she may search this whole wide world over, never find a sweeter man as me. I want the crap shooters to be my pallbearer, three pretty women to sing a song, stick a jazz band on my hearse wagon, raise hell as I stroll along. Let her go, let her go, God bless her. Wherever she may be, she may search this whole wide world over. She'll never find a sweeter man as.